。では、資料、今日の。はい
Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping announcements. So today we will use simultaneous interpretation. So uh, please set uh, the interpretation audio. So first, please click the interpretation button and select English, then mute original audio. すみません。あの、同日訳の設定方法についてですが、まず通訳のボタンをクリックしてください。そして日本語を選択してください。そしてオリジナル音声をミュートにしてください。Okay, so uh, thank you very much. We would like to start. Yes, uh, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, today's facilitator to Richard. Thank you. Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, virtual public session on our theme, Women Empowerment for Inclusivity in Disaster Risk uh, Reduction. Uh, my name is Richard Crichton. I'm a training officer here at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, uh, Division for Prosperity at the UNITAL office in Hiroshima, Japan. I extend a warm welcome to all our international community uh, partners, as well as our alumni of this uh, Women's Leadership in Disaster Risk Reduction who are joining us today. I would like to give a special appreciation to the people and the government of Japan for their support towards this program. I would also like to uh, mention, um, <clears throat> make mention of our 2021 uh, partners for, this for their kind support. Uh, that includes the government of, of, of Fiji through the National Disaster Management Office, the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Environment Program, SPRE, uh, Institute for Climate and Peace in Hawaii, uh, Waseda University, Tohoku University, uh, the University of Tokyo, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, and the UN Women. Uh, their contribution had made this year's training a great success. Uh, UNITAR started this training program on disaster risk reduction and women leadership to build the capacity of small island developing states in the Pacific region. Uh, since its uh, launch in 2016, the program has issued nearly uh, 300 certificates to its participants. From small humble beginnings, uh, the program has expanded and reaching a very diverse community of women leaders from around the world um, and have expanded to include uh, other gender identities. Most importantly, the program has also uh, prepared and certified people with disabilities with life-saving uh, knowledge uh, to use during disasters. Women are often placed in caretaker roles and gender norms and inequality place women and, and the people under their care at high risk uh, during disaster events. For example, in the 2009 South Thomas tsunami, uh, earthquake and tsunami, 70% of the victims were women. Uh, 
many elderly children and people with disabilities were also victim uh, to that tragedy. By empowering women, we make them a part of the decision-making process, and that will have a positive knock-on effect on, on our society. We have witnessed devastating impacts of disasters such as the volcanic eruption and tsunami in Tonga and around the Pacific Ocean. A uh, disaster coupled with biological hazards such as the COVID pandemic that we're, we're currently experiencing is creating multi-hazard uh, scenarios, adding additional complication to our efforts to respond to disaster effectively. We are seeing an increase in disaster uh, in climate-related disasters around the world, um, according to scientific data. Uh, climate change is increasing our risk to hazards. Uh, the Pacific, including Asia, are placed at high risk according to the World, uh, world Risk Index. Of the 10 most at-risk countries in the world, eight of them are actually from uh, Asia and the Pacific, with Vanuatu and Tonga ranked the highest at number one and number two, respectively. So this calls for a necessity to strengthen the capacity of those uh, living in the Pacific and as well as Asia to respond to future hazards. Today, we will hear from exemplary women in uh, women leaders in the disaster management uh, field. Without further ado, I would like to kickstart this session with uh, our first two speakers um, for their opening remarks. We will first hear from His Excellency uh, Dr. Tevita Suka Mangisi, the ambassador of the Kingdom of Tonga, to Japan. Following the ambassador, we will hear from Mr. Uh, Nikhil Seth, the Executive Director for UNITAR. Good afternoon and Maro Dele from the Kingdom of Tonga in Japan. It's such an honor to be able to provide again some remarks at the opening of this year's UNITAR Public Session webinar on the theme Women Leadership for Diversity and Inclusion in Disaster Risk Reduction. I am grateful for the kind consideration to express our ongoing support of this important initiative. Now, on behalf of the government and the people of the Kingdom of Tonga, thank you. I would also like to express our deepest gratitude to the government and people of Japan for supporting this program financially. I understand this event is part of the Women's Leadership a tsunami-based disaster risk reduction training program which prioritizes our small island developing states in the Pacific region and organized in observance of World Tsunami Awareness Day. As you know, Tonga recently on the 15th of January, a date that will forever be etched in our memory, experienced a double natural disaster with a volcanic eruption and an ensuing tsunami. And these happened whilst Tonga has been enduring the ongoing negative impacts of climate change and the pandemic. The irony of keeping Tonga safe from the pandemic by closing its borders is that in order to recover from the recent disaster, we must open our borders for aid relief. You would have noted in recent reports that Tonga had to turn back much needed relief from Australia because it was found that one of the workers was tested positive. How to allow relief supplies in whilst protecting Tonga from the pandemic must be a priority issue to be addressed. Lessons learned from this experience is also a priority given the new nature of natural disasters for Tonga, now including volcanic eruptions and tsunamis, in addition to annual cyclones and hurricanes. A recent discussion I had with business in Japan advised perhaps tsunami-proof shelters at strategic locations including transport routes to avoid congestions on the roads, must be considered in preparation. But it shows the multiple challenges Tonga must face as a small island developing state. Added to that, the effects of the ongoing pandemic exacerbate and compound the very nature of our vulnerabilities to climate change and natural disaster, which again evidences our situation as a special case for development amongst other countries. The embassy has been very overwhelmed with the love and support of the Japanese people, both private citizens and companies. Even though we are in the process of establishing a mechanism whereby we are able to accept donations for transfer to Tonga for the relief effort, the public have already started donating to other collection sites, including the newly established Tonga Friendship Association, NPO, that the embassy assisted in setting up last year. And even walking in off the street into the embassy with cash donations. Although we are almost completing the mechanism to accept donations for the public, 
We can confirm that the Embassy has and can accept donations at this time, properly account for them and secure them in the Embassy until such time the donation mechanism is finalized from Tonga. The Embassy will then inform the public at large. I wish to reconfirm the fact that the targets of the Sendai Framework for Actions for Disaster Risk Reduction, including those under the Sustainable Development Goals, cannot be achieved without meaningful participation, engagement and leadership of women. Women, after all, comprise half the population of our planet and we cannot leave half of humanity behind. This program contributes to the effort by the small island developing states of the Pacific to increase women's leadership for further, particularly in this critical area of disaster risk management and reduction. With the seasonal but perennial risk of tropical cyclones, where Tonga is either responding to or recovering from a cyclone at any point in time, our relatively low level preparedness and response capacity for big disaster events, combined with our existing socio-economic vulnerabilities, the impact of a tsunami has dire consequences on not only lives directly, but on the livelihood of the people and the country overall. I understand more than 100 participants from the Pacific Islands region and around the world have completed the training course today. There have been 16 participants from Tonga alone who had successfully completed the course last year. This invaluable source of capacity building adds to institution strengthening and our preparedness. Two of your recent graduates residing in Japan at this time have been sharing their knowledge received from this important course over different platforms advising Tonga on appropriate approaches. This is the training in real practical situations with Tonga's recent natural disaster. This program through its training and skill development to promote women's leadership in reducing disaster risk has made a significant and sustainable contribution to the skilled workforce in the region. I wish to once again commend the effort of UNITA and the final financial support of the government and people of Japan for the continuation of this program. I close by congratulating training participants who had already completed the course, as well as to those who are participating in this round of training. With best wishes to you all for success and to wish you a very prosperous and healthy 2022. Mano Greetings. My name is Nikhil Seth. I'm the Executive Director of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this UNITAR public webinar on the theme of Women's Leadership for Diversity and Inclusion in Disaster Risk Reduction. Women's Leadership and a more prominent role for women in decision-making has shown to play a fundamental role in reducing vulnerabilities, not only for women, but also for the elderly, children, people with disabilities, and other marginalized groups. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted women from around the globe, leading to 255 million full-time job losses, most of them women, and trillions of dollars in lost revenue. In 2009, 70% of the victims who lost their lives to the Samoa Tonga earthquake and tsunami were women. Disasters significantly affect women, young and elderly people, and people with disabilities. In addressing these challenges, UNITAR has completed the sixth training course, UNITAR Women's Leadership, a tsunami-based disaster risk reduction training program for world tsunami Awareness Day 2021, where more than 100 participants joined from the Pacific Island countries, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and the Americas. Our efforts were amplified through strategic key partnerships with the Cabinet Office of Japan, the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Environment Program, SPREP, and the Pacific Climate Change Center in Samoa the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, the National Disaster Management Office of the Government of Fiji, Institute for Climate and Peace in Hawaii, Waseda University and the University of Tokyo, and our UN partner agencies, especially UN Women and the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. 
I would like to highlight that this public session and the training program is made possible with a kind assistance from the people and government of Japan, to whom UNITAR is very grateful for this financial support, both for this project and in the past. I'm very happy that we are holding this public session with the presence of the esteemed panelists who will address us today from their respective countries, organizations, and sectors. I look forward to a very fruitful discussion with them. To all of you joining in, thank you for your participation today. Have a great panel discussion. Thank you. I'd like to express uh, gratitude for the Ambassador of Tonga to Japan and uh, the Executive Director for UNITAR for their opening remarks. Uh, today, as mentioned, we are very privileged to have with us uh, an esteemed panelist uh, today. Um, I would like to introduce them one by one. Uh, first up is uh, Mawala Ivao Namula Ulutautala Mawala. Uh, Ms. Mawala Ivao is the Secretary General of the Red Cross Society in Samoa. She has been with Red Cross for over 40 years. Uh, she first started with the organization as a volunteer in 1980 um, and quickly gained employment in 1981. In 1994, she was appointed as the National Secretary for the uh, Samoa Red Cross so uh, Society Board. And in 2001, she became the Secretary General for the Samoa Red Cross. Uh, this is the highest uh, national position in the organization. Mawala Ivao's work has not been limited to Samoa, but has been involved in uh, supporting Red Cross societies in Pacific, uh, in Pacific region and disaster efforts. She is a major fig uh, figure and one of the one who was at the helm is res in responding to the 2009 Samoa Tonga uh, earthquake and tsunami relief effort. Uh, please welcome Ms. Mawala Ivao Namula Ulutautala Mawala. Next is Ms. Uh, Vasiti Soto. Ms. Vasiti Ms. Soto is the Soko is the uh, director of the Fiji National Disaster Management Office, and the first woman to hold the director position in Fiji. Uh, significant milestones were achieved under her leadership. Uh, for example, the production of some uh, sorry uh, the production of Fiji's uh, community-based disaster risk management training manual. Uh, the expansion of the Fiji disaster response and materials and uh, becoming the first country in the world to validate target E uh, for the Sendai framework in 2020. The introduction of sign language interpretation on disaster communication. Uh, this is just to name a few. Uh, her expertise in geospatial science uh, and survey has benefited not only her native of Fiji, but also the Pacific region. She is a, an executive council member for the Coalition for Disaster Risk, uh, sorry, Disaster Resilience Infrastructure, uh, the deputy chair for Asia Pacific Technical Working Group on Disaster Related Statistics under a Disaster Related uh, Framework, and the co chair for Technical Working Group on Risk uh, Governance for Resilience Development uh, under the Pacific uh, Resilience Partnership. Uh, she is a member of the Pacific Technical Working Group on Human Mobility under the same partnership. Um, when she is not caring for her family, she volunteers her spare time in support of women uh, to develop businesses as part of the disaster response. And last year, she was announced the winner of the Women's International Network for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, WINDRR Leadership Award. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Vasiti Soko. Our, uh, lastly, we have, I would like to introduce Ms. Uh, Emiko Nukui. Uh, Ms. Nukui is a certified disaster prevention officer at the, uh, at the Welfare and Disaster Prevention Community Association. Her expertise is in disaster prevention and she is a certified condominium uh, disaster prevention manager. She has many years of work experience. Uh, this is in, uh, this is natural, um, for her, given her son is autistic. She is a strong advocate for uh, people with disability in reducing their risk uh, from hazards. Uh, Ms. Emiko studied English literature and Chinese in her undergrad, uh, undergraduate and took uh, her to many places uh, like Shanghai, Hong Kong and other parts of uh, before returning to Japan. Emiko is a doctor candidate at the Graduate School of Disaster Resilience and Governance at the University of Yoko. And she is, uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, University of Hyoko. Uh, she is in the final stage of her doctorate degree, uh, which she plans to graduate this March. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Emiko Nukwe. Um, again, we are very excited to have them today. And uh, we have asked each of the panelists to make a 10, 10 minute presentation. I will now turn the time over to the panelists for their presentation. After uh, their presentation, we will have a discussion section. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Mualai Vao Namla Ulu Tautala Mawala. Yeah, thank you, Richard, for that um, uh, kind uh, introduction to ourselves. Well, please call me Tala. I think it's much easier, you know, um, for the for the panel and for the audience. You know, if there's questions to be asked uh, after this presentation, I'm actually uh, the current Secretary General of the Samoa Red Cross Society. I just want to. Um, Start with introducing the Samoa Red Cross Society and its position in Samoa. Um, the organization used to be a branch of the New Zealand Red Cross since 1952. This is during the New Zealand administration in Samoa. And then uh, Samoa became uh, an independent state where New Zealand uh, left to go back to their country and Samoa was on its own. And this was when the work of the Red Cross uh, sort of came down the drain. In uh, the early 1980s, there was a revival of the organization, which uh, gradually became the independent uh, national society and uh, admitted into the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement as a member, you know, through the International Committee of Red Cross. That's how, um, uh, comprehensive this organization and its structures is. But um, we have about 192 national societies in every country, and uh, we are auxiliary to our government in the humanitarian field. And this recognition came about uh, following our government's ratification of the Geneva Convention. So with our auxiliary partnership in the government, uh, we have uh, an obligation, you know, um, between ourselves. And, and I, I would like to, um, to uh, at this point in time, to acknowledge our government's work through an action of several laws to recognize work of the Red Cross in the country. Uh, one of the laws uh, is, is our Disaster Emergency Management um, Act uh, 2007, where Red Cross um, roles uh, in disaster risk management um, is very much clear. And, and, and in any emergency, we have to activate our plans and activate the roles and responsibilities that we play in country like at this point in time that we are under lockdown uh, due to COVID-19. Our vision is to empower communities to recognize and address human suffering, respect human dignity, promote peace amongst all people. And our mission is to provide assistance and response more effectively to the impacts of disaster and climate change through our humanitarian services in accordance with the fundamental principles of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Um, I've spoken about the mandates given to us, and this is where we work freely through the fundamental principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, and, and so forth, unity and um, uh, voluntary service, as well as universality. And this is our strength where we can move freely into communities to work with our people there in preparation for any disasters, as well as to train them up to ensure they understand uh, the technicality of disaster risk more effectively when emergencies and disasters happen. With our um, auxiliary partnership with our government, we became a highly trusted partner 
of our government and our international community in disaster risk management, as well as from, uh, climate change adaptation management. And this is where uh, the recognition uh, given to us to play a deep, uh, human sovereign diplomacy uh, advocacy role where we can speak on behalf of our vulnerable people in the country, as well as uh, being a leader in first aid and only first aid provider in the country, as well as working uh, in assistance of uh, to our health management through blood donor recruitment programs, water and sanitation programs, where Samoa Red Cross is a leading agency in rainwater harvesting, and, and, and so forth. So a lot of these roles is to do with um, how we had come about identifying our goals and, and areas and objectives uh, from our, our uh, strategy for this year and, 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 and the future. Where we ensure that we respond quickly and assist people recover from crisis through DRM, through disaster risk management, where we can assist our communities to mitigate impacts by improving preparation uh, and, and building capacity in all the mechanisms that we, we could with, with all our um, responding agencies. And this is our government ministries and some of the uh, NGOs uh, pertaining to um, people with disabilities, the elderly, uh, and, and so forth. We also uh, work towards ensuring that we lead people uh, safety, their health, dignified lives, and opportunities to, to thrive uh, through our health and care in the community, providing uh, all the health services that um, government has mandated to the Red Cross to work on. Um, and all of that, we, we, I have been given also the task to also speak about um, how this has come about, um, referring to the topic of our, our, our meeting this afternoon uh, through women leadership for diversity and inclusion in DRR. I can safely say that women are leaders in all forms of engagement from household level to community and social groups up to their civic involvement, including politics, which is a community driven activity in identifying public authorities and political leaders. And these such movements play an essential part in holding public authorities to account especially with our nation's obligations to DRR and climate change adaptation towards community resilience. However, considering gender in the disaster sphere has centered almost exclusively on the vulnerability and capacities of women, where gender minorities display specific patterns of vulnerability associated with their marginal positions in society. Yet what's important is that they also possess a wide range of capacities through skill set diversity, where we include diversity by referring on to surviving their lifetimes, cultural abilities through physical, mental, and spiritual, their race, their religion, their gender and or sexual orientation, and so forth. They even represent an immense source of potential and power to combat the increased disaster risk that climate change continues to bring us. And these recognitions of these differences, the needs, the skills, and unique resources is essential to moving towards inclusive and gender sensitive disaster risk reduction. We used to say we need to go local, and this is one of the Red Cross uh, uh, slogans, let's go local because we wanna go into the communities. We wanna help them further realize the respect and invaluable gender-based driven contributions that they do to the community development and resilience. And by referring to the SDG5, 
where we recognize gender equality by empowering women and girls for sustainable development. We have to ensure that no one is left behind. And this has come out from the CNDI framework for, for PRR. And, and these are some of what we have believed is a strength that we can move forward, that we can integrate all the gender diversity into uh, disaster risk uh, reduction for, for, for the future. I have been asked to also um, um, say something about any changes that COVID-19 has brought to the way that we respond and how we can address it. I have identified through experience of the implications that are already seen in, 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 in a lot of levels, especially with education. Even from the start, the um, early uh, education up to university level, we know that everyone, the students, are now very much dependent on the use of technology. There's a lot of interruptions in norm and the way of life. They lose quality of classroom organic learning. They're going through steps and not by accident. They're, learn they're losing learning the hard way. And students may be surrounded with rich educational resources, but lose key capabilities. And these learning opportunities will go untapped. We also already seen threats to quality of life. There's poor or no class disciplines at home with ongoing disturbances of uh, doing family chores during um, um, virtual uh, education. We also believe that if a cyclone emerges during the lockdown that Samoa is in now, it's gonna be real chaos due to the disaster response limited access in providing our usual immediate response. And, and, and why uh, Samoa Red Cross in the past year engaged with um, 10 response agencies from government ministries as well as non-government organizations to go out and engage communities uh, through training of, uh, through uh, community disaster and climate risk management training. We call this CDCRM. And this is a toolkit of government that they have identified Red Cross to be the implementing agency in driving this training. And the essence was to ensure that our, communi our communities are ready. We know that they have um, put establishment out there through various groups under the authorities of um, village um, uh, councils. We have women's committee, we have youth groups, we have able men's group, the Aumanga. And these are the groups that are already established, but it's a matter of um, assisting them provide more skills, skills that it needed uh, and transferable to disaster risk management and climate change adaptation uh, work. And, um, and by doing that, we have seen a lot of good changes. Not only that people are, are, are ready, they, they have changed um, you know, their commu community attitudes, uh, with this uh, prolonged COVID-19 uh, pandemic upon us, they have improved their hygiene practices, disaster preparedness. They are actually moving up uh, from the coast where they've been staying all their lives away from hazard areas, such as riverbanks. They are now stocking up their relief and food supplies. They're planting, they're farming, they're gardening. Uh, towards food security. So these are some good changes that we have seen. The other change that is very evident now is migration. We have a lot of our young, able people that we have already trained and dependent uh, on, especially with our blood donor program and first aid provision. And they're migrating through the regional seasonal employment scheme to New Zealand and Australia because they are there to provide for their families. There, there's been a lot of uh, loss from the workforce since uh, COVID-19 came into the scene. And there's a lot of people who have lost jobs, but they're now picking up on the RSE uh, scheme where they are migrating away from our country. 
And these are some of the, of the fear, the fear of losing the manpower that we have dependent to in years, because these are our able community that are moving away, which means that we'll be uh, continuing to do uh, disaster risk management training and more development so that we, we can train more of our young generations growing up to have the, uh, the skills to respond more effectively when disasters happen. And, 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 and so forth. So I think um, with um, the progress of this program this afternoon, I believe we can contribute more towards the topic of our theme. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive uh, discussion or that comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, Red Cross is really dear to me. Uh, I know 22 years ago, uh, I received my first uh, first aid certification. I've continued to work with uh, Red Cross. So uh, we're very glad to have you here. Um, we will now move on. I know we have some questions um, in the chat box. We will come back to the questions later. Um, but due to time, we're going to go ahead and pass the time over to Ms. Uh, Vasiti Soko. Ms. Vasiti. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, distinguished guests, development partners, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Ambulavinak, and a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, on behalf of the Fijian government, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak at this very important event. Um, also, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, the hard work put in place by the Tonga National Emergency Management Office in coordinating the current response and on behalf of the Fijian government again, uh, we wish to reiterate to our Tongas brothers and sisters that we stand in solidarity with you as you go through this difficult time and as you build back better. With no doubts, the Pacific National Management, uh, Pacific National Disaster Management Agencies, or in Fiji, we are called the NDMOs in other regions such as Tonga, they're called NIMOs have made considerable progress in reducing disaster risk and enhancing the resilience of countries and communities over past years. The mandate that NDMO are being given is very broad in that it includes mainstreaming of DRR across relevant sectors and vertically across all government level from the office of the prime minister right through community level. NDMOs are also responsible for building capacity in preparedness and response to disaster and are the key agencies that have the convening power in facilitating a whole of government approach in disaster response. This journey has not been easy with very risk drivers that constantly are hindrances to DRR work. Disaster management arrangements must change according to, the, according to meet the increasing challenges posed by climate change, growing population, disease risks such as COVID-19 and the compounding effects of natural hazards causing disaster. A good example, as mentioned earlier, um, the double jeopardy that happened in Tonga. Therefore, it is essential for us to ensure inclusive DRR measures are undertaken with a strong focus on inclusivity and community engagement. DRR also requires empowerment accessible and non-discriminatory participation paying special attention to people disproportionately affected by disasters. Inclusion and gender responsive DRM approaches cannot be taken in isolation. We need greater clarity on roles and responsibilities across all levels and sectors to achieve this. Therefore, we need to ask ourselves the following question. How do we as a society under the issues, understand the issue and specifically risk informed development? how we frame the problem that are confronted in everyday life, particularly by women, and how we seek to ensure that women are empowered, not just to participate, but to lead. The answers to this question is fundamentally central to our ability to be able to chart a form, a more effective pathway towards achieving DRR and development goals. Fiji has taken steps to strengthen data collection and analysis to have a better targeted and efficient response. The, this initiative was trialed out in the recent tropical cyclone Yasa and Anna that emphasized on development of a multi-sectorial assessment form in an online platform with an inclusion of disaggregated data. 
Since this was one of our first online based rapid data collection for a big scale event, there was obviously lessons learned that we are working towards improving such a system and processes to serve our communities better and ensuring that no one is left behind. The Ministry of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation with the support of the ADB conducted a consultation workshop on using the Fijians law, policy and governance to support women's resilience to climate change and disaster risk in 2020 as an example. The outcomes of the consultations highlighted key policy recommendation across sectors for women in small medium enterprises to developing a gender mainstreaming supplement to guide how inclusion principles can be mainstreamed together with BRR. This has been incorporated into the review disaster legislation process and Fiji's NDMO approach to mainstreaming BRR. The inclusion of gender considerations into national level legislations and policies will promote and enable new national level programs to be implemented that will target towards the most vulnerable in society. <clears throat> Fiji, like other Pacific Island nations, have faced, have managed multiple emergencies with complex and in addition to complex long-term COVID-19 pandemic, where the country was hit by Tropical Cyclone Harold and Yasa in 2020, and then followed by Tropical Cyclone Anna in 2021. And more recently, the Tropical Cyclone Kodi and the eruption of the underwater volcano in Tonga that caused tsunami and ash fall throughout the region. However, we were able to manage such compound challenges through a whole of society approach. I am glad to share that Fiji's success in humanitarian action before and during disaster is a result of a strong led government coordination mechanism, but most importantly, the partnership established with our stakeholders, including civil society organizations. The Fijian government through NDMO and key government ministries manifested a whole of society approach to COVID-19 response operation. Under this initiative, a community engagement team was formed that was tasked to undertake implementation of awareness program, conduct community profiling, and deliver assistance to vulnerable communities. As a result of this intensive community engagement program, we managed to convince members of communities in high-risk zones to be vaccinated. To promote community engagement and support better coordination, Fiji NDMO is in the process of developing a community-based disaster risk reduction policy. The community-based approach to disaster risk management ensures that local problems and needs are considered and appropriate and timely actions are taken in addressing them. It recognizes and values local culture, local capacity, including traditional governance and leadership networks, such as the chiefs, faith-based organization, CSOs, and women groups, as well as local conditions and developmental issues. Local communities are the first line of defense in preparing for and responding to a disaster. This is evident in communities across Fiji, whereby hours after the impact of disaster, search and rescue and basic immediate provisions to the injured and the homeless are mostly entirely carried out by the relatives, family members and neighbors. Therefore, it is crucial that communities are involved in planning decision-making process related to environmental disaster risk governance and development of appropriate strategies that mitigate loss of life and damage to livelihood and infrastructure. Some of the ongoing initiative in this space undertaken by the Fijian government includes the development of the Community Disaster Risk Management Manual. This is done to standardize training across communities this involves partnering with relevant NGOs and CSOs to ensure that training package has a holistic coverage to disaster preparedness, first aid, psychological first aid and livelihood. Secondly, the development of a national disaster risk management volunteer scheme for Fiji. This is part of the outcome of the development of the community-based risk management policy in strengthening community participation by empowerment. To increase the country's resilience, the process should begin from within communities themselves for each individual to have an identified role. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come a long way to achieve the goal of having a more inclusive, diverse, and a holistic disaster risk management approach. It is therefore important to take the first step 
to ensure we create the environment for our children as future leaders to continue the good work we have embarked on. I thank you for your attention and binakavakalevu. Binakavakalevu, uh, Ms. Sotko. Uh, this is uh, very uh, intriguing to hear. Um, and I do agree, policy needs uh, a whole of society approach, especially at the national level, and we commend you for, for all the work. Um, I just want to leave off with, uh, in quoting what you said earlier, efforts should be made not, not just for women to participate, but to lead. And I totally agree. Today, uh, we'll now pass on the time to Ms. Nukui, Emiko Nukui, who will uh, present, uh, share with us her presentation. よろしくお願いします。それではで、子供を育てる中で、え、特別支援学校に通っている時にPTA活動に、え、従事しました。そこで、え、大阪府で、え、え、私が地域の防災力を上げていく、そして地域の防災力が上がることによって、たとえ親が亡くなっても障害のある子供がきちんと災害をうまく乗り切るために何ができるのか。また、え、
、日本でも大変な猛威を振るっています。大変な猛威を振るう中で、えー、悪いことだけが起きたわけではないというのが災害の現場で起こりました。皆さん方も、えー東日本大震災や日本で起こる台風被害の報道の中でたくさんの人たちが狭い場所にぎゅうぎゅうと押し詰められている現場をご覧になったことはあるのではないでしょうか避難生活の場所避難所と言いますが避難所の環境問題が非常に大きな課題でしたところが新型コロナウイルスに対,対応するために人と人の距離を取る、あるいはたくさんの避難の場所を作っておく、そういうことを考えた中で、避難生活の環境整備が非常に進むことになりました。これは2年前の,あの熊川という熊本県にある大きな川が被害を、洪水がを起こした時の、えー、その周辺の人吉市というところの避難所の様子です。災害が起きた直後からこのように段ボールベッドですとか人と人の,あの隔てになるパーテーションを使って、えー、密を避けたりまた人と人との距離を取るという対策が取られましたこれは長年私たちボランティア災害に対応するボランティアの間でも被災をした避難所にはあのこのようなあのパーテーションを入れるようにまた段ボールベッドを使いましょうということをあの活動してきましたが新型コロナウイルスの感染が広まったことで一気にあのこれが日本中に広まったという事例としては挙げることができます。なぜ私が障害者の防災を研究しているかというと。過去の災害被害を見ていると、やはり弱い人、この社会生活において、えー、弱い面を持っておられる方、高齢者や障害者、あるいは一人で暮らしておられるような方、あるいは経済的にあの、えー、十分に、えー、強いうちに住んでおられない、そのような方がこれまで、えー、地震や洪水の犠牲になってこられましたでも共生社会みんなで生き抜くみんなで助け合いながら生活をしていく共生社会においては弱い人が災害で亡くなっていく世界は決して良い世界ではありませんでは社会全体の課題として災害を捉える場合にじゃ誰に重点的なあの対策を取っていくのかということを考えると優先的にやはり障害者や高齢者に対し障,障害者や高齢者が災害に対して強い力を持つあるいはその,あの守られた環境を作っていくそれが大事なのではないかというふうに考えています。東日本大震災の現場では障害手帳を持っておられる方が障害手帳を持っておられない一般の方よりもたくさんの方が亡くなりました。身体障害をお持ちの方だけではなく、津波被害、津波,あの津波がこうやってくるところから走って逃げることのできなかった身体障害をお持ちの方だけではなく、知的障害や精神障害、発達障害の方も、一般の住民の方よりも多くの方が亡くなっておられます。また、えー、東北の震災の現場であります岩手、宮城、福島の3つの県を比較してみますと地域性があったことも分かりました。実は宮城県が突出をして障害手帳を持っておられる方が多く亡くなっていかれましたけどもこれには共生社会の,実,あの実践というものが、えー、深く関係をしていたと言われています。宮城県でたくさんの障害のある方が亡くなっておられることには、えー、沿岸部に病院や福祉施設がたくさんあったということもありますが、もう一つ言われていることは、えー、障害のある方、あるいは高齢者が自分の住みたい場所に、えー、住んでおられた。しかし、それが沿岸部に住ん
沿岸部であろうとも住みたい場所に住んでおられたのだけれども、そこに防災の観点、えー、大きな津波が起きたら、誰がどのようにその危険を伝えて助けに行くのか、あるいは一緒に助かるのか。そのような計画も立てられていなかった、またそのような訓練もしていなかったということが挙げられました。これも大きな課題として、この東日本大震災の後の障害児者、このようなあの要配慮者といいますが、災害時の要配慮者に対する対策の大きな方針となってきています。また、障害がある方たちは、避難所に避難するということを躊躇されました。実は今、コロナウイルスがあの蔓延していますが、えー、新型感染症の感染下においても、避難所に避難をするという方、非常に少なくなってきています。これは避難所で感染するのではないかということを恐れてなのですが、この感染症の前から、障害があったり、あるいは介護をしなければならない。あるいは妊、えー、妊産婦さんですとか、そういった方たちは、避難所では適切な支援が受けられないのではないかということで、避難所に避難することを躊躇しておられました。またこの躊躇は、避難行動をのタイミングを逸することで、逃げ遅れという事象も招いてきていました。東北の現場で、じゃあその障害者や高齢者に誰が逃げろと伝えたか。これは一番は身近におられる家族の方、そして2番目に挙げられるのはご近所や友人の方、そして今時は3番目に挙げられるのは福祉関係者なんです。じゃあ同じように誰が逃げるのを支援をしたのか、これも同様に3番目に来るのは福祉関係者、消防や警察よりも福祉関係者が当事者を助けていく。いったんだという結果が得られましたそこから考えられるのは、えー、当事者を支える身近な支援者家族や、えー、その周りにおられる友人方をの防災の知識やスキルを上げていくことがまずは大切だなということが分かりますまた当事者を支えるために地域コミュニティ全体でその当事者をどう支えるのか、また当事者が避難をする福祉避難所という制度が日本にありますが、その福祉避難所を担ってくれている福祉関係者をどのようにして地域全体で支えていくのか、これも東北の震災から得られた大きな大きなあの、えー、方針だったなというふうに思っています。このえー、津波被害のあった東北の現場を福島県の特別支援学校の先生だった中村先生という先生が、えー、聞き取り調査をされました。誰に聞き取り調査をされたかというと津波被害で命をなくされた障害者、障害児の親御さんに聞き取り調査をされました。えー、重度のの身体障害をお持ちのえー、子どもたちだけではなく、軽度の障害の発達障害の子どもたちも命をなくしておられます。そのような現場で聞き取り調査をされた、えー、中村先生は言われます。障害児者を高齢者が世話をしている家庭も多かった。その高齢者の判断が遅れて、えー、逃げ遅れた事例というものがたくさんあった。だけども、えー、この災害が起きる前から自分の子どもが自閉症だということを近所の方に伝えていたのでその時に近所の方が助けに来て助かったこのような事例もいくつかありましたしかしながら残念なことに、えー、障害者にとって地域の助け合いはとてもとても重要なことだけども必ずしもうまく行われていなかったということが挙げられましたこれは大きな課題となりました。また4年前には私の住んでいる大阪府でもあの中規模の地震が発生しました。私の住んでいるマンションでは震度5強、そうですね、止めていない家具に置いていた本が落ちてきたり
するそのような被害がありましたけれども、えー、残念なことに、えー、小学生の女の子が学校のブロック塀が落ちてきたことで、えー、亡くなりました、えー、5名から6名の方がこの災害で亡くなったのですがその時にこの、えー震源の周辺のエリアに3つの特別支援学校がありました。その特別支援学校に通っておられる子どもさんの,あの親御さんにアンケート調査を行いました。その中で、次に震災が起きたときにどこに逃げたいのかということを聞きましたら、やはり障害理解をしてくれる、自分の子どもの障害についてしっかりと理解をしてくれている特別支援学校にやはり逃げたいんだ。特別支援学校に行くまでに歩くと4時間かかるけども、公共交通機関が止まった後ではとても行くことに困難が生じるけども、やはり特別支援学校に逃げたいんだということを言われるお母さんたちが多かったです。そして私たち日本人は今、国難と言われる南海トラフ地震に対応しようとしています。この南海トラフ地震は、えー、おおよそ100年に一度、発生しますそして最後の最後にこの、えー、南海トラフの地震が発生してから随分と時間が経ちますので今発生の確率は 80% ほどだというふうに言われていますそろそろ起こるのではないかというふうに私たちは構えをしていますまた大きな水害も頻繁に起こってきていますこれは4年前の西日本豪雨災害の時に被災をした特別支援学校の様子ですこの特別支援学校、1階部分がすべて水に浸かりました。この様子を学校のホームページで、えー、配信をしています。学校が被災をすると、そこに通っていた子どもたちは、この学校に通うことができません。この学校では4箇所に分かれて、学校の特別支援教育の継続を図りました。そして学校が完全に復旧するまでには、1年以上の時間を要しました。このことを考える上で、学校も事業継続計画を作ることが大事なのではないかということが言われるようになりました。事業継続計画というのは、たとえ大きな災害が起きても重要業務をやめない、重要業務をやめることになったとしても、できるだけ早急にその重要業務を復旧させるということを目標において、事前に準備を進めるという計画のことです。また、この計画は PDCA、えー、ちゃんと方針を立てて、えー、計画を立てで、それを訓練や研修などで検証し、また、えー、その検証に応じた振り返りの中で、改善点をあの適切に改善をし、また次年度につなげていく、この PDCA サイクルで回し、マネジメントを行うことに、えー、しています。これを学校全体の特に特別支援学校の学校 BCP として整えることを私は活動として行っています。なぜ学校 BCP かというと、これらは、えー、今、えー、大阪府の特別支援学校で策定をしている計画の数々です。でこの計画がどのフェーズに対して有効かということをまとめてみますと、災害、特に水害、大きな水害ですとか、えー、特に大きな地震災害が起きたときに、その起きた直後の対応の計画はたくさんあるのですが、えー、事前の準備から学校の復旧までをのそのオールフェーズで見ていく計画が少ないことが分かります。このオールすべてのフェーズで対策を立てることができるのが、えー、学校 BCP であるのです。で学校 BCP で大切にしていることの、えー、一つとして、学校の防災計画は日本では、教職員は児童・生徒の命を守るために、えー、このような活動をするという計画になっています。そこに、教職員の命を守るということ、教職員も命が守られる対象であるという計画がありません。そこで学校の防災体制を整えていく中で一番対策が整っていない自分の備蓄品を学校に置いていなかったりそのような人たちっていうのは実は学校の先生なんですこの学校の先生を守られる主体にするために学校の防災計画の方針としても
、児童、生徒と教職員、すべての命と尊厳を守るための計画です。ということを冒頭に置くようにしています。そのために、今、私は今ある、えー、障害児者のための計画をつく使うことを今特別支援学校に提案をしているところです。これで地域全体のマネジメントを回すことができるのではないか。先ほど、えー、とタラさんのご報告でも、またあのバシティさんのお話でもありました、コミュニティベースとの取り組みにつなげていくことができないかということです。私たち障害者は生まれた時から学校に通い、またえー、高齢者になっていくときまで何らかの計画によって規定をされています。この,あの計画の中で個別の教育支援計画というものが、えー、学校に滞在をしている学校に所属をしている期間立て,立てることになります。この計画はどのようにして作られるかというとまずは、えー、親やその当事者を保護する人、施設の職員かもしれませんが、その保護者が素案を作ることになります。で、その素案に沿って、保護者と当事者、そして学校の先生が面談を行い、話し合いをし、その素案の内容に沿って、教師は指導計画を作ります。そして学校と家庭で特別支援教育の実践を行い、それをまた当事者と保護者と学校で評価をしその課題については次年度でまた新たに目標を立てて実践をしていくということを行っています。これに防災の観点を入れることを今大阪府で行っています。どのようなことかというと素案を作るときにお家で自分のお家がどのようなハザードにかかっているのか、水害の時に洪水で何メートルつかるのか、津波のハザードにかかっていないのか、土砂災害警戒区域に入っていないのか、そのようなハザードを調べてもらいます。住んでいる各都道あの市町村のハザードマップが日本は整っていますので、ハザードマップ上に自分の家庭の場所を書き込んでもらいます。そして避難をする避難場所を3箇所決めてもらって、それもそこまでのルートも同じくその地図上に示してもらい、それを学校の先生と共有をします。学校の先生はそのハザードを見ながら、ハザードマップを見ながら防災教育の目標を立てます。そして学校と家庭で実践をし、評価を行い、そして課題は次年度に送って、またあの新たな課題に対して対策をしていくということです。ここに家庭が巻き込まれることで、家庭はイコールコミュニティともつながっていきます。ここに PTA の活動もつなげながら、地域と一緒に特別支援学校が福祉避難所となるための体制を整えていこうというのが、私の研究の大きなところになります。また、特別支援学校ではこのように、親が最初に亡くなっても、親が2人とも亡くなっても、子どもだけが亡くされていても、速やかに、えー、地域の,あの支援団体や福祉の支援団体に子どもを引き継ぐための、子どもの取扱説明書、障害の特性ファイルを作る、このような活動をしている学校もありますし、またこれは私の息子のそのための簡単な情報をまとめた SOS カードです。このカードがあるおかげで、迷子になった息子と警察の方をつなぐことができて、警察の方から速やかに私に連絡が来ることができました。このような取り組みをしていく中で、よく障害者団体もあのこのような SOS カードを作っているのですが、困りごとに対することの情報だけを載せておくと、その当事者の困りごとだけに対応したあの支援がを受けることになりますが、ここにその当事者が何を好きなのか、その当事者は何をすることが得意なのか、何ができるのかという情報を入れておくと、その当事者が好きなことに対する支援も一緒に受けられ,る受けられます。この観点をあの今皆さん P、同じく特別支援学校の PTA としてあの、PTA の卒業生として、特別支援学校の PTA の皆さんに一緒に考えていてもらっているところです。
では最後に私のお話の締めくくりとしてこの絵は私の息子の絵です。私の息子は、えー、重度の、えー、障害があって言葉でのコミュニケーションはできません。ただ大好きなミニカーを一日中こうやって眺めて過ごしています。そして3週間ほどかけてこのような絵を描くことができます。息子は私たちに伝えてくれています。どのような障害があっても必ず、必ず力がある。その力を信じて、防災の対策を立てるときには、必ずその本人の意向を一番に持ってくる。本人の話を聞くことなくして、防災の,個,あの個人の計画を作ることをしてはならない。また、コミュニティでの計画も、個人の尊厳を守る、この個人の意思を一番に真ん中に持ってきて作るべきだということを、彼は伝えてくれていると思っています。では以上で私のお話を終わりたいと思います。ありがとうございました。Thank you so much, Ms. Nukui. And I echo the same、uh, in the comments. <laughs>、uh, what a wonderful picture. And thank you for your work in addressing、uh, and being a voice for, for、um, the needs of people with disabilities.、Um, I know that we're running out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and、uh, start. I, and I see there's a very active engagement in terms of questions raised by our participants. So I'm going to raise just one question for our discussion.、Um, I would like to ask the panelists to spend one minute to respond, after which、um, we will then move to the questions from our、um, From our participants. And I do apologize if we do not get to your questions in time, but it will go in, in terms of the order that it was received. So, <clears throat>、uh, the question to our panelists I know that uh, women, uh, children, and people with disability, elderly, the poor, and those who are marginalized are at higher risk、uh, due to the access to information,、uh, access to knowledge, and resources. What measures should be taken to promote inclusivity? And equitable,、uh, equitable disaster risk uh, uh, mechanism to ensure that no one is left behind. I'll start off with uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mawala Ivao, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you for the question.、Uh, I was speaking about the The CDCRM program that we carry out in the community. And this is、uh, a very inclusive program because it involves everyone in the community, meaning even people with disabilities,、uh, the households, and, and, and everyone. Before we even go out to do the program, we have to go to all the households in a specific community to collect data. We have to make sure you know, what numbers are there, what、uh, vulnerability and capacities are there. The essence of that is to do、um, situation analysis in specific communities because we need to map, map it out and see where hazard areas are and so forth. And, and where vulnerabilities are, if there's capacities, we have to make sure the capacities are well utilized、uh, to overcome vulnerabilities. And, and, and that happens before we do a, a one week training, a week long training. And the training where we engage、uh, about 10 responding agencies from government ministries and NGOs. Uh, particularly, that look after people with vulnerabilities and, and disabilities, people with chronic illnesses, and so forth, all the problems that happen around in the community. So, they come、uh, during the week to, to,、uh, to, to teach and train people to present their respective roles、uh, in disasters and to make sure that people understand、uh, how to react. And respond、uh, more efficiently when disasters happen. And、uh, at the end of the whole week of training, we、uh, do a simulation exercise on whatever has it.、Uh, you know,、uh, the community would like、uh, to, and because at the end of everything, we will draw up their plan. In accordance with what has been trained on. 
And some of the skills that we train them on is actually first aid, of course, psychological first aid. Um, you know, with fire, how uh, fire and emergency services would react to any, uh, to any emergency that happens within the community. Or, I mean, all the kind of hazards. We even went to the extent of doing body management, search and rescue. And this has been from um, our experience of the 2009 tsunami, when those things happened, you know, before a lot of us uh, received training on those particular incidents that happened in a, a disaster. So this program is actually training the whole community. And at the end of it, we uh, divide communities into respective emergency response teams. And the main response team is, of course, the village mayors, the, you know, the village council. They will oversee all the other um, response teams. You know, uh, those the one response team will look at uh, the immediate response. The other response, you know, where all the necessary um, uh, uh, facts of life, you know, uh, you know, the need, the immediate needs, you know, people who will be uh, requiring the immediate need. You look at water and sanitation. Uh, if there's any injuries, we have a first aid team that's already get trained and certified uh, to do the work. Uh, as well as all the other uh, emergency response teams. So they have their respective roles and responsibilities. And in their plan, uh, these uh, things, you know, will, will, um, will be provided in. So at this point in time, uh, because everything is actually coordinated by our National Disaster Management Office, which is government, the NDMO and EMO in, in other countries. Uh, because um, every uh, other plan is now activated with the lockdown that we're in. And even our teams in the community's plans are activated. So they are there watching out, looking for any other signs and symptoms of problems that may happen and report back to the NDMO. And so, uh, oh. you know, our respective roles go. So, so with the question that was asked, this is the, the channel of communication. And anything that happens, you know, uh, within uh, reach will, will be dealt with immediately. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Mawala, Mawala Ivao. Um, I know we're kind of pressed on time, so I'll quickly give the time over to uh, Ms. Nukui. I know we've lost uh, uh, Ms. Soko, but I hope uh, she will join back uh, later. And Ms. Nukui, could I ask you to keep it within one minute? Sorry about that. Hi. Uh, so this is an inclusive de cohena bosai taisakuna tameni to you koto de adeto, a hari, saigai de inocho nakuste ikaderu hito te yunua, a hari nanaka no yuasa o motte wada de kata. De sono kata no ano o tsuyoku steak koto, na yari taise tato motte imas. Nihon dewa ima hazard map ni motosuite, chiku bosai keka ku tateru te yu koto ga ano arete de kote ki ina sedo to ste. 広まってきています。で、そこにあのいろんな主体が入っていくのですが、学校があの避難所になりますので、学校を中心としてこの地区防災計画を立てていく中でコミュニティ全体でそこまで逃げてこられないような方がどこにおられるのかそういったことも考え
Uh, so we are actually fed by our respective uh, organizations and ministries, you know, of what is going on. And all of this is coordinated by our office of NDMO, National Disaster Management Office. Now it's an EOC. So once uh, disasters happen, you know, it's, it's uh, quickly switched to the New York, you know, National Emergency Operating Center. And that office is represented by all the liaison officers from all the uh, responding agencies. So they will be manned by people from all the other members. Uh, so any other thing that happens will go through that structure. And it goes down to the community, of course. Um, that question was from Miriama and uh, Elizabeth too. So we, I apologize that we are running out of time. So we'll take one more question. And this question is for Ms. Nukui. Uh, involving both gender will empower a community. How do you think of the challenges of, of achieving this?え、男性も女性も半分ずつですよね。で、あの、男性の問題、女性の問題だけではなく、また個人の尊厳の問題に集中することで、え、男女というダンジョの問題もやはり思いやりで、え、対応できるようなそのような世の中になるよう、あの、たらさんもそこさんのお話もあるように、トレーニングを積む、積んだ人たちが、あの、たくさん出ていけばいいなというふうに思っています。Thank you so much, Ms. Nikui. And I, I do apologize and welcome back, uh, Ms. Soko. Um, we're going to move on because of time. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of questions, a lot of interesting questions that came through the chat. And we do apologize for the time. Uh, we do have a special presentation. Um, and I would like to uh, bring it, um, to bring to your attention two of our most recent graduates, Sandy Tripolotu and Simata La uh, Palu. Uh, they are from the island kingdom of Tonga, who will be currently, uh, who are currently living in Japan. Um, they have uh, chosen to speak on the disaster and the impact that it has on the island nation of Tonga and the Pacific region. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Simata and Ms. Tripolotu. I will uh, uh, come back after the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Maloilele and my name is Simataila Abalu. Joining me here is a former co-worker and a dear friend of mine, Sandy Tupulotu from Yamanashi and Tokyo, Japan. Before we begin, I'd like to share a short disclaimer. We do not represent the government of Tonga, nor are we affiliated with any organizations or associations within the government of Tonga. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Simata. Our presentation today will be based on the situations of Tonga, as you all are aware of the volcanic eruptions followed by a tsunami that hit Tonga on Saturday 15 January 2022. Moreover, we'll be sharing what we have learned from the women leaderships in tsunami-based disaster risk reduction training program. The incidents is described as a once in a thousand years explosions. The eruptions of Hunga Tonga, Hunga Haapai was unprecedented by scientists and geologists alike. According to NASA, the blast released hundreds of times equivalent to Hiroshima nuclear explosions. The Tonga government stated, as a result of the eruption, a volcanic mushroom bloom 
was released covering all of the Tonga Islands, which is basically 80% of the land were covered. Generating tsunami waves rising to 15 meters, hitting the west coast of Tonga Tapu Island, Ewa, and also Hapai Island. The tsunami evacuation map shows here on these slides. It's only for Tonga Tapu Islands. When the tsunami hit the island of Tongatapu, everyone has been evacuated towards the inland area and also the eastern sides of Tongatapu. Toward the evacuation area, it's on one road. As you can see here on the top, identify the main roads. As a result, the road was changed. We'll be sharing our stories and also of what we have learned during our TRR course. Completion TTRR course did help me to understand the whole scenario of a disaster from my preparations to a recovery stage and also provide assistance to my families and friends. And lastly, it gives me confidence during devastating time in Tonga. Understanding the importance of preparations, I contact my friends, families and also colleagues to prepare for the disaster a week ahead. During the disaster, I managed to reach out my families about two to three minutes before the network off for a word of encouragement and also a peace of mind for myself, knowing they already evacuated and saved. And I did also send a thousand tones during the disaster. I must say after two to three years days of not hearing from them, anxiety kicks in. But I'm grateful that I did connect to Simata every day and later on with Lavinia to review and discuss what we have been learned during the course and what we need to do now to help our families and friends in Tonga. When Sandy wrote me on Friday, she told me that the tsunami marine warning was activated. One of my sisters lives right across the shore, so I quickly jumped on our family chat and started sharing the steps on how to prepare for a tsunami. I even shared contacts of DRR staff in Tonga. With the loss of communication and knowing that tsunami had fallen, I started sharing DRR tips on my personal Facebook page as a medium to calm my anxiety and other users as well. This was soon picked up by an Australian media and I had an exclusive interview discussing disaster relief and avoiding dumping. I also befriended uh, Lavinia Tamoy Bellatu, and together with Sandy, we began discussing relief and recovery. And during this time, I also assisted Tongan families living abroad, helping to connect them to families in Tonga, local contact in Tonga. Please be advised, there will be some images that may trigger some viewers. So after the eruptions and tsunami, the infrastructures, communications, residents, businesses, and also transportations have been damaged. Moreover, rubbish has been washed down to the town town area or Nukarofa capital area and also the western side of Tongatapu. As been mentioned before, 84% of the islands were covered with ashes. These ashes has been affected the crops and also the residential area. Also, that many animals did not survive. So what's happening now? On the 19th of January, the government of Tonga declared a state of emergency, and in response, our international friends started rolling up relief, which we are grateful among others who committed to this. But the Tongans didn't wait for the relief to arrive. Instead, as pictured here, a vendor selling her produce along the street. It's also encouraging to see communities come together to donate to help those in Ha'apai, like done by the LDS in Moa. Our men were also busy. They got creative and found ways on how to help with cleaning up of the streets. As mentioned, foreign aid started rolling in, of which Tonga is truly grateful for. Picture here is the Prime Minister of Tonga with the Ambassador of Japan in Tonga, among ministers in cabinet and members of parliament. So what do we know now? Due to the volcanic eruptions, Tonga lost all connections except for satellite connections. So the first official media statement was not released until the 18th of January. Since then, we've had two press conferences from the government of Tonga and a second media statement. To highlight, the initial disaster assessment began on Sunday the 16th and is ongoing. They did confirm three fatalities um, and with a severe loss of cable connection, Tonga is not expected to be up and running in full capacity for at least another month. Tonga is truly grateful for international support from its donor partners, which provided timely assistance. The government of Tonga also provided immediate cash relief 
to households that were directly affected. A need for sufficient drinking water is going to be a problem that has to be addressed not only in the short run, but also in the long run. Uh, effective on the 24th of January, the government of Tonga approved a tax waiver for all goods um, imported into Tonga for relief. In a separate interview, Tongan geologists discussed exploring options of zoning out areas, and this gives residents the option of either relocate or remain in the current uh, location. We were fortunate to reach out and have two of our group members uh, share their experiences in Tonga. Um, the first one, Nao Bloomfield, who resides in Hala Ovave, which is in Nukualofa, shares that she was overwhelmed with mixed emotions. Fortunately, she grabbed her go-to bags and her kids, knowing the shortcut to the highest point in Tonga Tabu, which is in Mataki Ewa. She shares that this course allowed her to map out the shortcut route, and then she drove on the main road. She also stopped to pick up an old farmer with his tools. She shares that choosing to evacuate early allowed her to help him. And her words of encouragement, cash is best. And she draws upon Psalm 65 from the Bible. Lupe, on the other hand, resides in Fuamotu in the Eastern District. She shares that because her home is in the highest area in Tonga, she decided to help her family first by making sure the water tank was covered from dust. Then she started reaching out to her friends in the low-lying areas and invited them if they ever need shelter. So after all of that, she was able to also help her siblings and keep them out from visiting the beaches. Her word of encouragement are also drawn from the Bible in the book of Joshua. If there's one thing I'd like to share about the Tongan people, it is we are resilient people. Uh, we are truly grateful for our international friends and communities for supporting us during this very difficult time. If you'd like to donate and help make a change in Tonga, please feel free to donate to any one of these accounts, or you can contact the closest Tonga High Commission office, Tonga consulate or embassy near you. We thank you for the opportunity, and we ask that you please spare a moment for Tonga. Tonga will come back. Tonga will build back stronger and better. And together, we will see Tonga thrive once again. Malong albito. Ms. Palu and Ms. Tupulotu, Malo Abito Lavamai. Thank you so much for that presentation and also to our um, our other previous uh, participants who are based in Tonga who were not able to present, uh, Ms. Bloomfield and Ms. McLeod. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. Um, I would like to close off our session. Um, and uh, I first would like to express our gratitude to our panelists and, um, <clears throat> and our guest speakers today, especially our <laughs> our alumni speakers, as well as our uh, participants who are joining in on this session. In closing, I would like to call on Ms. Junko Shimas, uh, our program officer and team leader for the Division uh, for Prosperity for the UNITA Hiroshima office. Okay, thank you, Richard, and um, thank you, everyone. I would first and foremost like to thank the wonderful panelists today. I know all of our speakers today are dealing with serious situations in their homeland, but have taken the time to speak to us at this event. Ms. Tauchara Mawala, thank you so much for speaking at this public event while Samoa is under the state of emergency and the national wide lockdown brought by COVID-19. Ms. Vasiti Soko, thank you so much for your time while Fiji is dealing with the cleanups uh, from the recent tropical cyclone Kodi. Ms. Emiko Nukui, thank you uh, for speaking while many cities and uh, prefectures of Japan have been placed under restriction of Mambo. Last but not the least, Shimata and Sandy, thank you so much for responding our request and then recompiling and then reporting the current situation in Tonga very quickly. Since UNITAL started the women's leadership in tsunami-based disaster risk reduction training program in 2016, we have seen more intensive and devastating disasters from around the world. Those events combined with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic proves just how complicated it is to deal with multiple hazards simultaneously. This trend will likely continue into the future. There are difficult times, which is why capacity building 
to respond and prepare for such events is of the highest importance. Everyone should play a role in protecting their own lives, their families, communities, and their countries. This morning, I received a very impressive email from Alna in Tonga of our training program this year. Her name is now Bloomfield, and I will read her email. After taking the UNITAL course, I obtained a shortcut route map to evacuate point, and I took that route with my family and many other Tongans in this event. The condition of the road was another story, but it still allowed us to evacuate early with no traffic that many of our people experienced during the evacuation. We thank you UNITAL and the government of Japan and many other partners for, for the help uh, and many assistances. We continue to ask for your prayers for Tonga and as women for the many roles we pray after the tsunami for our family, community, workplaces, and for the nation. Hope is still there for us Tongans. Thank you now Bloomfield. And then we continue to send our prayers to all Tongans. And once again, I would like to extend my appreciation to the government of Japan and partners, especially those in Sendai, Ishinomaki, Wakayama, Hirogawa, Hirogawa Town, and of course Hiroshima for their generous and continuous support for this important training program, which has brought 288 such women leaders from the Asia, Pacific, Caribbean, and Indian Ocean to learn from the disaster response of Japan. They have been equipped with greater knowledge and skills to prepare them against possible natural and biological events. Many of them are now playing important roles in leading their communities and countries. I express appreciation for all our participants joining us online to our guest alumni and a prospective, prospe uh, prospective future alumni to this program. Thank you for joining us today. Finally, I would also like to thank the UNITAL staff and then interpreters for their efforts in making this event a success. I hope today's UNITAL public event with such outstanding women leaders from the Pacific and Japan have inspired and encouraged more to take the lead because the world needs you. Thank you so much. And uh, sayonara, arigato uh, from UNITAL Hiroshima office. Arigato Hi, Minasan. Arigato gozaimasu, Jungo san. Uh, so, with that, we conclude our session today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'd like to uh, express gratitude for making this session possible to all the players who uh, contributed today um, and for our presenters. Uh, thank you for your preparation and your time. Uh, with that, I now close the session and uh, wish you a happy and uh, prosperous day uh, in the beginning of this year, 2022. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. That's what.